Hello everyone, it's Shane Kanto, your Wasteland reviewer, and welcome to Lost in the Wasteland, my weekly interview show where I get to learn a little bit more about somebody else's perspective on movies. And we're in the 170-something episodes now of this, which is insane. And I was going back to some earlier episodes and realized my friend Aaron here hasn't been on since like episode 40-something, and I'm like, wait a minute. Oh, uh-oh. <laughs> so... I, I just, I know you're a busy man, so I'm just going to let you do your thing, and I'm happy to be on whenever. Well, and Aaron is back. Thank you so much for coming on. For sure, dude. Anything for you. Oh Well, before we jump into the questions, would you like to shamelessly plug anything that people could check out? Sure. I mean, if for some reason you still want to hear more about me from the end of this episode, uh, check out Sif Pop Writer's Room. I host a podcast for... Uh, that Shane appears on once or twice or sometimes three times every uh, we'll call them semesters, like six months. Yep. Um, and the theme of the like kind of we're running right now is I just pick a writer for this website that Shane and I write for. And we uh, um, uh, are crossing off movies off of my watch list, um, which has been really fun because um, I I just I've got I'm a, I'm a buyer, not a renter. And um, it's been really cool to like see movies for the first time or like watch movies that you know for whatever reason i just haven't watched in years that are essentially first watches for me or whatever it's like i watched gattaca last week and gattaca is amazing and i watched moulin rouge for the first time this year and it's my second favorite first watch of the year i loved it i was like there you go i don't know when i would have watched it except for the podcast but the podcast maybe i was like that's incredible like i'm not a huge baz lerman fan but i love that movie so I'm gonna be rewatching uh Moulin Rouge for the Scribe podcast. It's so fun. As our buddy Luke from Zip Pop uh -huh. chose to pair that with Aquaman because of Nicole Kidman. <laughs> There's so I do two, so I do two movies a week on that podcast. Um uh -huh. and and like sometimes I'm trying to find pairings and sometimes it like happens to work out really well. Like I'm like, oh, I think I just threw them together because they were the last two. And then they wind up working really well. Like, I'm pretty sure, uh, or like, I'll try to think of things that pair together. For example, last time you were on Shane, we did Brawl and Cell Block 99 and 310 to Yuma. Yep. Two prison adjacent movies. Yep. Um, but like, I picked two together, uh, Mandy and Tenacious D and The Pick of Destiny. And they like actually kind of worked well together in terms They're of They're both like, very heavy level. metal. <laughs> yeah. Oh, one, well. <laughs> one literally heavy metal. And then one just has like yes. the most insane heavy metal vibe you're gonna find. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's like that was one Can of you our... imagine Nick we did Cage the and Jack Black in a movie together. Like, it's gotta be. And Nicolas Cage apparently just said he's only got like four or five movies left in him. But like, I really hope that he's in a Jack Black movie in, in one of these. But like, um, we did uh the producers of Mary's Poppins Returns, which was like kind of surprisingly close ish in mm. tone and. Um, yeah, lots, lots of, lots of, lots to be excited about, and uh, at least on the podcast for me. And um, I'm having fun. And if you are interested in listening to somebody have fun, um, then uh, Shift Pop Writers Room Podcast, wherever podcasts are sold. There you go. And I definitely understand the feeling of checking things off the watch list. That's what Rowan and the Wasteland is all about. Oh yeah, <laughs> Rowan and I both keep checking things off our watch list. So yeah. Which I do have fun with that podcast too. So, and we keep it nice and short and sweet. And nice and short. That's that's my, that's my main thing. I love about it. Like I love a good twenty three minute podcast, man. It's like bottom boom done. Uh -huh. on. It's like I popped it on, got in the shower, and it was over. That's the three episodes by the time I got out. Like <laughs> there you go. Now to get things started for this third round. Mm -hmm. Now, Aaron, if you had a whole day. Mm -hmm. and you're going to have a movie marathon, what would you have the theme be? Shane, this is the only question that I don't have an answer for you, and I think it's largely because I think it, like, it all just depends, right? Like, mm -hmm. I could pick, I like, I don't know what the context is. Like, I could invite my friends over and be like, I just want to show you my four favorite movies of all time, or it could be like, I want to show you the four movies that make me the last the most, or I, four or five, whatever. Or, like, the movies that make me laugh the most. Or, like, the movies that, like, are just ingrained with so much soul. Like, I don't I don't really know. I think there's a million different answers to this question. Fair. And, like, I, like, I don't know what, what's a good starting point. Can you, like, guide me? Can you give me, like, a, like, a, 
any like any sort of context like it's your birthday you pick any four movies you want sure. um like which is funny because what i do for my birthday is i literally just take off a day and then watch a bunch of my favorite movies so yeah, yeah say you're robert does lord of the rings off. every year yeah say that you're taking off your birthday okay and you have the flexibility to pick like you some of your favorite movies what are you watching Hmm. Is this just by myself or is this like, let's just say it's a Saturday and my friends agreed to come over with me or to come over and watch movies or like you're chilling on uh, you're chilling on a weekday and you just by yourself and you want to watch. it. OK. Man, um, I don't know that I would plan it out. I think I would just pick whatever movie feels right next. Um, like that's just kind of the way I go with the flow. Like yesterday I was just like listening to another podcast uh franchise paradiso that we were talking about a little bit before mm. uh this and um they like i just finished their episode but they're doing a halloween retrospective and like i binged the, the all the original halloween movies before ends but like didn't watch the rebooted ones up until that and i was like man mm. like it's been a while i've been wanting to watch them and i need something to put on in the background it's like sure i'll do the first one and i'm like my wife called me in the middle of the first one she's like hey i'm gonna be late from work today it's like I got enough time for the second one, so like I just watched hey. them both back to back. Like, um, let me let me let's just say I'm gonna pick movies that like are my most feel good movies of all okay. time. Um, like the movies that just kind of hit me like right in the sweet spot, which I've I've come to like instead of ranking movies on like best or favorites, like it's 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 favorites to me. It's it's what is that movie that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I try to think of it in 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 like bracket challenges. Like Shane, you just popped two movies in front of my face and said, "Which one are you picking?" And you just count down until you get to the very number one. And um, so uh, movies that just feel totally right to me, and to me, like those are movies that like don't take themselves too seriously, but also like don't treat their stuff like as folly. Um, but also manage to have some pretty funny moments. So. I'll throw in uh, The Nice Guys. Um, that's my favorite movie of all time. And I'll throw yeah. in the Knives Out, which is my second. Um, I'll throw in... Um, I, I thought of one that I think... Oh, I totally forgot what it was, though. Um, I'm looking at my letterbox favorites right now just to kind of get a, get a sense. Um, I, I really love... It might be a little bit too dour for this marathon, or maybe like it is, and then I just get to pick me up. But um, I saw The, the Kid Detective was my favorite first watch of 2023. Mm -hmm um like that like kind of feels like a really nice mesh with those two mm -hmm. and for the sake of grabbing a fourth um look i have a sweet spot for heavyweights i don't know what it is it's just it just creeps up my favorite movies of all time list and look I, i'm i'm not gonna lie i think like i think it's in let me see I, it's uh i don't don't ask me how it got here but it got to my 42nd favorite movie of all time and i think it's gonna climb man do it to it <laughs> lars I, ironically <laughs> it's got legs man yeah <laughs> there you go it's got stamina i can feel it tony <laughs> it's a fun movie it's it's <laughs> just i i had a, i have a group of friends that i meet with every monday night and we we just pick a movie and we watch it that way it's like no commitment if somebody can't make it fine we get to talk about life and share drinks and whatnot. And we watch a movie and it was the first week we decided to like shift to this format. It was Labor Day weekend, Labor Day itself. And I was like, what's a, what's a better Labor Day movie than heavyweights? <laughs> so I show up and I'm like, we're going to watch this 90 movie, nineties movie about Ben Stiller taking over a fat camp and turning it into an exercise camp. And they're like, I'm so down. And <laughs> it's just, it's just perfect. Cause we're better than you. <laughs> <laughs> I it basically but, feels like a prequel to uh to dodgeball. It know. does. It does. There's uh, the same character. Th there's been a handful of movies that I've shown my wife of movies that I adore that she's like not a big fan of. Um like the biggest like you know um uh, I, I, don't, I don't know the right word for it but like disappointment in our marriage I guess. Uh, is when I showed her Scott Pilgrim versus the world and she got up about an hour and she's like, I'm sorry, it's just not for me. And I'm like, oh, that's okay. I'm going to finish it myself. That's fine. <laughs> uh, and this was like a year and a and half you're just ago. Like... like, don't worry, we're still married. Like, so uh, <laughs> it's obviously it's not something I can't overcome. But like, I was 
there's there's a couple movies when I showed her the nice guys for the first time like she she likes that movie like just as much as me and wants to watch it she's mm-hmm. more of a like rewatcher than and I'm more of like a let's experience something for the first time mm-hmm. and man it's just like I'm so glad that she liked heavyweights because I don't know what would happen if you didn't because a lot of these like dumb comedies that I showed her she's like cool I don't want to watch that again like hot rod and I was like oh no <laughs> and. Or like I was in the hospital and needed to pick me up. And so I was watching the three ninjas movies and she's like, what on earth are you watching? And I'm like my childhood. And she's like, leave me out of it. And I'm like, I want a divorce. Uh, (laughs) Oh man. But yeah. Heavyweights is a good time. Now, Aaron, if you had a friend who has never seen a movie before, Mm -hmm. what movie would you show them first? I thought about this for a long time because like I think there's a ton of great answers here. I think I got the right one, but okay. I wanted something that is going to be impressive. Some this person has never seen a movie, right? So what's gonna be something that's gonna like look visually stunning? What's gonna be something that's gonna like you're gonna look at it and you're gonna be like, man, what did you say that was called again? Uh, cinematography. Um and and I wanted something that would also like one of those scores that just sticks with you and like when somebody watches a movie and they're like oh that's acting right yeah cool sign me up for that but also i wanted something that really demonstrates why film can mean so much more than just pictures on a screen um something that can communicate with my personal favorite part about watching especially a the movie for the first time again um like just getting to experience um like those moments and Shane, I went with Arrival. I think it's it's not it's sci-fi, yeah, but it's not it's not off-putting mm-hmm. to people that aren't sci-fi people. It's got a couple of funny moments in it. It's like a brisk like two hours flat. It's got mm-hmm. an excellent performance, uh, excellent performances anchored by Amy Adams. Yeah, it's got a twist that is that will just leave you sobbing combined with one of my favorite scores of all time and of course it's directed by Denis Villeneuve so you know it's just the most gorgeous looking movie out there I thought long and hard about it I almost picked Blade Runner 2049 but I think enough of that relies on the context of Blade Runner which I think is overrated but good um I, I yeah. think Arrival is my pick man like out of the two of those if it was somebody who'd never watched a movie before there's not the ac- extra baggage yeah of yeah. the other movie but no a Villeneuve film would be a very interesting choice and Arrival is quite a special one. So yeah, I like that answer. That That's definitely very different than a lot of the answers I've gotten from this because, you know, you'll get your Star Wars, you'll get your... Back to the Future, the future. Jurassic yeah. Park. Yeah, all the all right answers too. This is, but... a, this is a different kind of science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now... But like, they don't quite... Man, dude, I, I just... Every time I watch Arrival... Like it creeps up my favorite movies of all time list and it just leaves me in a sobbing mess. And I'm just like, why can't all movies be this perfect? Like yeah. perfect film. Um, now, so good. I have a singing feeling mm-hmm. that I know the answer to this. You question. would be surprised. <laughs> so I know a lot of people say a lot of things about sequels and getting sequels, mm-hmm. but what's sure. one film that you think should get a sequel? Um, so obviously because the nice guys is my favorite movie, that's the easy answer, right? Like, and, and every time, yeah, it's a given. So I got another answer for you too. Um, like it's a given and any time that like, like Russell quote crow about a month ago, like tweeted a picture of him hanging out with Ryan Gosling. It's like, Hey, this guy's really funny. I want to hang out with him more. I'm like, yes, I want that too. Please, (laughs) please just record it. Um, and, and have Shane black around and call it a day. Um, like, I like obviously that's my that is my like make a wish, yeah. you know, <laughs> card, right? But for the sake of doing something, it's saying a movie that you that isn't so obvious if you know me. Um, I'm gonna pick a movie way out of left field, a movie that I don't even necessarily think is good. I think I like it more than most people. Um, but I think it's because of my love of the first one because this is this will be a sequel to it second film in a franchise okay. that hasn't gotten a third film mm-hmm. that I crave and that's Pacific Rim Uprising um interesting because Pacific, yeah that one kind of killed it 
Well, it did. Now, in fairness, there was a big time gap and we had a complete like recasting of the main characters. Yeah. Guillermo del Toro did the original, but he was working on Shape of Water, so he didn't do Uprising. But like Stephen S. DeKnight of Daredevil, I think, fame, did, did that one. And look, it goes off of the rails, but in a way that I kind of like. Like... I, nobody was ever taking Pacific Rim too seriously. So when the when the sequel goes bonkers and have and has Charlie Day essentially reenact it, the postman scene from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, where he just goes yeah. crazy, and you're like, oh wow, don't let your kids around that person. Like I'm yeah. just like, <laughs> I don't think I'm like I like it's dumb, it's ridiculous. I but I love it, and I don't know that I've ever seen anything like it. And I think it's visually really impressive and. I think the sequel delivered on the biggest ask from fans of the first movie, which was just give me a fight scene in the daytime. And all the fights are in the daytime and they're awesome. And there's no rain. I, and right. And John Boyega is leading it like, and he's great. Um, and he, He's a great actor. He's not, he's fine in the movie. He's doing what he can. Mm -hmm. um, it's, 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 uh, it's fueled by my love of the first one. So it's yeah. got, it's also kind of got the caveat. Like I do want Guillermo behind the camera again but yes i like i i at this point i just want another movie like what's interesting is i also want a third movie to a franchise that guillermo del toro started mm -hmm. because i still want my hellboy <laughs> three <laughs> all these years later <laughs> i i'm shocked that we haven't gotten it yet like in the wake of all this like it's snyder's justice league and like he wanted to make a hundred and fifty million dollar Hellboy movie, and neither of those movies justified somebody giving him a hundred and fifty million dollar budget for it. You're right. But now people throw around budgets almost twice that, like it's candy. I, man, I wonder. Hellboy, Hellboy is, is it? It's DC, right? I think it's. A separate thing. I, oh, I thought it was like a subsidiary of. So well, it's not like proper DC, but it might be like Vertigo. But I mean, I know it's not Vertigo. Um, we're gonna look like chumps here. Um, well, that's why I'm fact checking. So continue. Yeah. Um, Dark Horse Comics. Dark Horse, which I think is a subsidiary of Marvel, actually. Oh, DC. Never mind. Um, wait, no. no. Never mind. It, it was, was initially pitched. So apparently Hellboy was originally pitched to DC and they're like, no. So it looks like Dark okay. Horse Comics is in was published independently. Well, and it says Dark Horse Comics do luck link up with DC, but yeah, nothing officially. Anyway, mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know if there's a rights issue because like we've gotten the David Harbour Hellboy movie and whatnot. Can, but either, I'm I'm surprised we haven't gotten a third one, even if it's just like turn you know an animated Netflix movie or something. Anyway. Um, yeah, yeah, Netflix, you make it. Something about Guillermo del Toro doing you throw a money second. around like it's nobody's business. Come on. Yeah, they're giving Zack Snyder how much money to make mediocre crap? Like, sorry, I guess if it's mediocre, it can't be crap. Mediocre stuff, like I haven't it's seen like, Rebel Moon Part One and Two, all, but I know how I'm going to feel about it. They gave him to make his rejected Star Wars script. Yeah, because apparently he brought that to st the Lucas films, and they're like, no. Nah. And I've been more proud like, of Lucas films in my entire life. And then Netflix is like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, they're like, well, you're a trending topic on Twitter every day. Yeah. And 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 you managed to make Army of Thieves a popular movie, which it just shouldn't have ever been. And Army of the Dead, which is again mediocre and semi enjoyable, yeah. but smash hit for Netflix. There you go. Because of Snyder. But I do like the idea. Like I, I would definitely take another Pacific Rim. Just yeah. cross it over at this point with MonsterVerse. Get yeah, all nuts. dude. Absolutely, absolutely, one hundred percent. Especially like in in the wake of like man, there's a. You know what? You know what? I legitimately almost answered for this was um, um was Transformers: Rise of the Beasts um because the post credit scene had me screaming in joy, like when I, like I did not see it coming. I thought it was going to be like I'm not going to spoil it. I guess 
But I thought they were teasing Sector 7 since this was like a prequel thing. I thought they were teasing Sector 7 and was somehow going to do that. Kinda... Like, I, wh why do I care about Sector 7? And then the reveal comes and I'm watching it with my wife. And other went, oh, like screamed as loud as I could. She's like, what? I'm like, they've been talking about it for years and nobody ever thought it would happen. Just like they were talking about like. You know, maybe this could also be an answer, but give me that 23 Drum Street Men in Black movie. You um, know what? When those emails geez. leaked, I'm like, this is the dumbest shit ever. I need it. This <laughs> idea is terrible. And then now, in 2023, it would have been the most amazing idea ever. Well, there was, there was that. On me so much. They were talking about uh, crossing over Fast and Furious with Jurassic Park. And there was like this Transformers talk about crossover with this other IP that yeah. it seems if we get a sequel, we're getting that. And I'm like, please, for the love of God, I don't ask him for much anymore, <laughs> but I'm asking him for the nice guys part two. <laughs> One of my coworkers to get fired <laughs> and this movie, <laughs> which at this point, like I, I, Especially after like MIB International, I would so want yeah. Jump Twenty Three M MIB Twenty Three Jump Street, whatever the hell they're gonna call it. We should have had that already. We should hundred percent. Now, Aaron, what's a film from your childhood which you haven't watched in years that you'd be most interested in uh, going back and rewatching? Uh, this is actually really hard for me to answer because I have been on a nostalgia trip for the yeah. past couple of years and partly because of doing the podcast before we changed over to this format. Um, the OGs will know that once a month we would talk about a movie from not necessarily my, but it could be just the writer's nostalgia, yeah. like something to revisit. And we've kind of got off that a little bit, but like it does still play in every now and then. So like, I feel like I've left no stone unturned on that um on that part of the podcast in, in terms of like revisiting re revisiting things from my childhood because i think the stuff that i like legitimately think i would still enjoy like i've seen like mm -hmm. like i i came across a tiktok from uh jeff from films at home the other day yep and he was like here's five nostalgia movies you forgot about and i'm like i totally remembered all five of them well four <laughs> of them because i never knew of one of them um and he mentioned Jungle to Jungle, which is not a movie that I've seen in forever. But I'm, I don't think I'd like Jungle to Jungle watching it again. Like, that's yeah. different. <laughs> right. So, like, I'm, that's not my answer. Um, so my answer is going to be um, two movies that are actually up or three movies that are actually upcoming on the podcast on this next schedule. Foster, uh, Fellowship Pop Writer Foster is joining me to talk about Looney Tunes back in action. Nice. Which, based off of the Rotten Tomatoes scores, like, oh, boy. But 10 year old me loved that movie. Um, it'll also be interesting watching it like with the Brendan Fraser of it all in 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be weird seeing him skinny again. Uh, I'm also watching The Mummy for the first time in a month. So that's fun. Um, and he and we're also talking about The Brave Little Toaster and The Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars. So uh, yes, be prepared. Yeah. For like suicidal air conditioner. <laughs> like I didn't know. I didn't remember that, man. <laughs> Be prepared. I've warned you. <laughs> yeah, but like I've seen Heavyweights again. Like I watched all the three ninja movies. Like again, like I've hit all my nostalgia ones. Like those are kind of the last. I'm sure I'll think of some, but those are the ones that I'm like, I own. Yeah. I just haven't gotten around to seeing. Like I own The Great Mouse Detective, but I don't know that I've ever actually seen it. And like, and like a year ago, I watched Oliver and Company again. Like I've done it, you know? So yeah. Yeah. That's my answer. Hey, on I want to rewatch the Brave Little Toaster, obviously. <laughs> and so long. Now, if you could visit a place from a movie, where would that be? I do have to ask you, are we talking in universe or are we talking filming location? In universe. Okay. Um, I think it's really interesting because um the Sif Pop social media has posted this exact question on today's like i did see that interaction <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't want to just respond and just be like uh middle earth duh because <laughs> that uh, was the thumbnail that was the thumbnail yeah 
Yeah. Nash has been doing a great job with getting interaction on that. So it wasn't me. Um, um, I, I'm going to put my same answer I said on Twitter because, um, man, I think this is such a difficult question because I think the coolest places are also like super dangerous. And for that reason, I don't want to go like, yeah, I would love to see like the Blade Runner 2049 universe, like especially that Vegas. Right. But like, it's just dangerous, man. I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to go somewhere where I can, you know, like I risk my life or whatever. Like, I think a fun answer might be like the future from back to the future, but like, I uh, cliche and whatnot. Um, I picked, I picked the, uh, now I, I do have a caveat. I picked the, um, the setting of glass onion, um, like uh, that, that private Greek Island. Island. Yeah. Private Island in Greek, seemingly perfect weather. And like clearly a quadrillion air, yeah. you know, built the house. So it's got all these fancy gadgets. And I'm not, even, I'm not even saying it has to have the Mona Lisa in it or anything like that. But a few caveats, um, primarily being I don't want to be with the cast of Glass Onion. Maybe some of them can stay, but like, I don't want... You want to hang out with the Benoit Blanc. I'll hang out with Benoit Blanc there, absolutely. But I don't want the Edward Norton or Dave Bautista characters there. Specifically, Benoit Blanc and the guy who keeps getting high. Yes. Who's <laughs> just there. Yes. yes. Yeah. Th- just, just, uh, just me hanging out with Benoit and that guy and... Let's throw in uh let's have Marta come for a visit from Knives Out and you know any nice. any 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 of the Knives Out characters can come and visit except for Hugh for obvious reasons. Um but I think look I again outside outside Benoit Blanc is on vacation. He's not investigating, you know, yes. like um I like I and, and let's also you know all the hydrogen stuff, yeah, that can also go away. But like I just think like Private Island in Greece, seemingly perfect weather multi-million dollar mansion yep. sounds like the life with ben Wall and daryl 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 Darryl. <laughs> and benoit's partner can come too because that's hugh grant so it's gonna be so grumpy <laughs> i just imagine it's just hugh grant and he's just like oh i hate it well, oompa loompa <laughs> i'm also wondering too because like that movie takes place during the pandemic and i think they make it a point to say that like he abandoned like he he doesn't have people there on the island except for Daryl. So like presumably that's also fully staff fully staffed, you know, bartender, culinary. Oh, okay. Like right, like that's also Normally. I think given, but either way, if they're not around, that's also fine, you know. Yeah. Now I'm I'm all my dream vacations are all inclusive resorts. I don't I don't want that like yeah. go, go travel and do everything yourself. I'm like, I want to go drink in warm weather by by a pool you know with my shirt off with which most people are going to be like hey put your shirt back on and i'll be like you know what this is america and they'll be like it's not but (laughs) but i'm an american (laughs) it it is now and i'll (laughs) plant a flag and and yeah um colonize it there you go (laughs) now aaron what's a film that you watched way too young Mm -hmm. i have two answers for this actually um (laughs) For 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 reasons that I think, I know what you're intending. I know what you're intending to ask, but I do think there's two great answers to this. Okay. The first one that I'll say, I think most movies actually, um, because I was the youngest of four, which means in most of the rules, uh, my parents just didn't give a crap. Yeah. Um, like they were a lot more lax about everything for me. Um, and I had an older brother that was five years older who, you know, like I was, he was born in 1990. Mm-hmm. And I was born five years later. So he was like 13 when Eurotrip came out. And that's like a perfect 13-year-old's movie. So I watched Eurotrip at like eight or something. So the, the real answer that like the answer that I put here, I said most movies, because I said like yeah, my parents didn't like censor stuff that I watched. Um uh, although for some reason they didn't like me watching The Simpsons, but whatever. Um I of wasn't all things. A kid. Yeah. Um I do remember one, I, I'm going to say this movie in particular, because I do remember at one point watching and being like, interesting that I'm allowed to watch this as like a seven year old. Like, and I just assumed, you know, but like I went over to people and they're like, oh, you can't watch that because it's too violent. And I'm like, like, and then I went to Bible college and they were like, yeah, we couldn't watch Harry Potter. I'm like, you guys are crazy. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> uh, Stripes is my like, oh my God. 
Like I was watching Stripes as like a seven or eight year old, and like it's look, it's not like the most gratuitous or anything, but like I remember there's a scene of a general perving on uh, peeping Tom and on some women in the shower, and I was like, I think that was the first movie where I ever realized like nudity is sexual right like a lot of me growing up in kind of that environment has desensitized me to a lot of that um so like sure i might have been watching stripes as a five-year-old and not realizing you know anything and then at one point was like oh huh like interesting that i'm just good to watch that like and i think that was also the time i started realizing that not everybody was just allowed to watch whatever they want so Mm -hmm. My other answer is Casino Royale, um, because that came out in two thousand seven, right? Six. Yep. Six. Okay, I was eleven, and my mom took me to a theater because I loved the Pierce Bronson. So she took me. I I've watched James Bond movies since I was probably seven. So (laughs) yeah, no, I I get you. (laughs) Well, and here's and here's my thing, right? Like I grew up watching them. My mom grew up watching the Sean Connery era and all that. Uh, So like. She took me to go see Die Another Day in theater. She took me to go see um, uh, Casino Royale in theater. We saw Quantum of Solace in theaters together. Like, um, and then I went to college by the time Skyfall came out. But like, I was an eleven-year-old wanting a James Bond movie that was like the Bronson era, and so I left Casino Royale going, "Sure, it's fine." But then I watched it years later as like an 18 year old and I've come, I'm now 28 and I think it's very close, but Casino Royale is my favorite Bond film. Um, So the answer to what's a movie you were too young to see, I was just too young to appreciate how great of a film Casino Royale is. And I'm, I was even thinking maybe there's a movie that's on my watch list that like maybe 2001, a space odyssey, a movie I've tried to watch and like twice and haven't maybe when I'm 50, I don't know. (laughs) Um, but I picked Casino Royale because I was like first time I watched it I was 11 and it was clearly a new direction for Bond and to fully appreciate it um, one should be older than 11 absolutely now what film experience do you feel like legitimately made an impact on your life (sighs) Shane I came with multiple answers to every question I'm not I promise I'm not going to give all of them the whole time um I think the answer to, for me is Cinema Paradiso. Um, I think it is. And the reasoning is, I think that movie completely changed how I perceived movies, which I didn't see it for the first time until six months into the podcast, a year and a half into writing for the website, you know, kind of six months into editing the podcast, uh, editing for the website. Like I was for sure a movie guy and I'd never seen it. And I had seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of movies. And I'd never seen that one. And I think that was the movie that just made me decide that the best movies are the ones that make you feel something, whatever that means. And it's okay. And, And the best movies are the ones that make you cry. Like they just are shut up um, about your like you know like I, I it's just not not only that but i think that was that was the movie to me that just kind of elevated i think that was the first foreign movie that i ever loved um mm-hmm. outside of like i love the raid um but everybody loves the raid you know because it's different experience too <laughs> yeah um so I I think I think it just changed the way that I view movies and it's it's changed the way that I perceive them and it's kind of led me to this point where I'm just like you know whether a movie is good or not is relatively subjective. Um it's how much you enjoy a film and what films can mean to one person and I I know the film is also more about like lost love um uh, than it is I think it's about just as much about cinema as well, but like it's just as much about lost love, which I don't really have any experience with, but like, I just, I just think that that was a movie that I watched and I was like, I get it. And I want to be a movie lover. And that's why I can watch something like the gray man and be like, you know what? It's fine. Like (laughs) it's not offensively bad. 
I didn't waste my time. Sure, is it disappointing? Yeah. But like, what did you expect? Like, um, and finding things to appreciate, you know? So like, I just, I think that was the one that really just kind of shaped the way that I start to view films or have viewed films. Well, and that film has certainly made an impact on me to the point where I came out to the love theme at my wedding. Yeah. Yeah, for uh, sure. And if, Morcone. if I would have seen that movie before I got married, probably me too. Um, I did come out to a theme of a couple that we'll talk about in a couple questions, but um, um, I it's it's it is my favorite film score of all time. Absolutely. So amazing. Mm-hmm. It's he was he was a master and did it for so long. <laughs> and I am so upset because every couple of months I'll go into just watch or I'll try, I'll Google something. Giuseppe Tornatore, Tornatore, who made Cinema Paradiso and another really under criminally underseen movie called The Legend of 1900. Yeah. Um uh Giuseppe Tornatore made a documentary about Ennio and it's never released in the US. <laughs> but it's it was like it's made, it released in like the, in Europe in 2022. And there's no U.S. release date, and there's no like, and I'm like, oh, I, w- I will give anything to see that movie. <laughs> I want to watch it. <laughs> I also want to watch it. Now, what movie would you turn into a TV series? I've I've got the right answer here, um, <laughs> and I had to I had to come off of my favorites of all time list because I realized they're my favorites for a reason, right? They uh, work as is. So I took I did some digging. I have two answers I'm really happy with, but one that is better, and that's Reminiscence, um, which is, to me, a underrated and underseen film. It kind of just got pushed to the side. I mean, it actually, I think, was marketed pretty okay, but I don't think anybody actually saw it besides me and but, uh, Stiff Pop Crew. It's a super interesting premise. The film itself is fine, but I just want to live in that world more. It's Inception-esque. Um, it's noir, it's got mystery and it's a film that I just, I just love. And it's, I I love, even though it's not perfect. Um, I love its imperfections, but it's just, I want to live in that world. And I think that's a much more compelling story. If, um, if, uh, um, if it's stretched out to a mini series or series length, I, I imagine that season one the movie is season one you know like i'm sure they can explore after that or whatnot you know anthology or whatnot but it certainly has an interesting vibe and concept and everything and i think being able to explore that world and the concept around it would be an interesting thing yeah back yeah, why not? Since he's reprising all of his other roles too. Um, yeah. So, I also put um kind of similar notes. I think Last Night in Soho would be a much better series, mini series than a movie, um, which is a movie that I love. And um, um, I, I I rewatched Constantine about a year and a half ago. Keanu's Constantine, and yeah, I think that's an excellent second film in a trilogy, as opposed to whatever it is. And so I kind of put that for. But Reminiscence is my my answer for sure oh i i would definitely be down for a keanu uh constantine show throw that on max mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to us now um what's your favorite film romance yeah um my first my first instinct was mary and tim from about time but as much ah. as i love them that the ro- the romance that i care more about is between tim and his father yeah uh, but then, and then I thought, all right, fine, me and Sebastian, or maybe even Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone from Crazy Stupid Love, that also works. Mm. But then I came across one that I just think is actually my favorite. Um, I'm going with Joel and Clem from Eternal Sunshine. Okay. And I think the reason why is because they're very clearly not perfect. Mm-hmm. Yet, we get to the end of this movie, and we are like, we have seen, oh, wow, like that is really actually pretty toxic at points and it's really harmful to each other and it's dangerous for one another and it's surely like emotionally dangerous for one another. But you get to the end of the movie 
And the message of the movie is one of my favorites of all time, which is just, isn't it worth trying again? Like, sure, it happened once. That doesn't mean it needs to happen again. Like the message of the movie, you know, the end of the movie where he's like, I don't care that I just relived all this experience. Like, give me all the memories back. I want to live with that pain. And I'm willing to go through it you again. Should. Right. So that's to me, that's why Joel and Clem stand out, because the end of the movie says they are terrible for each other, but we are still rooting for them versus all the other movie couples are like, yeah, we're rooting for them because they have great chemistry and great performances and great dialogue and screenplay, which also Eternal Sunshine has. But and, and you know, kind of same for La La Land, like me and Sebastian, which is the wedding theme that um, yes. I walked down the aisle to um, with my groomsmen. But um, the like, sure, they're not together at the end and we're still kind of rooting for them, but we're also kind of happy with where they're at. Yeah. But like the only like the only ending of Eternal Sunshine that I consider like you know, head canon or whatever is that anybody watching the movie is rooting for them saying, you go, Joel, you go find Clem. And yeah, we know how it's going to end, but we're along for the ride. It's 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 the tale of uh, um, Orpheus is, is what it is. Um, so I, I pick Joel and Clem. Interesting. That certainly, uh, like I, there's, I think especially people around our age love Eternal Sunshine for a spotless mind. It's so and good. I think the first time I watched it, I've had some very visceral reactions to films like that because how much I like fundamentally disagree with the concept mm -hmm. in practice. Like I had the same reaction with her. Yeah. Like somebody falling in love with AI freaks me the hell out. Mm -hmm. And I'm definitely a person that does not believe you should erase your memories because like you grow from those experiences. But you know, when you really take a step back and by the end you realize, yeah, you shouldn't be erasing them and that's the point of the film so i can appreciate them now more than when i watched it for the first time when i was like 19 i think so and that film is definitely quite impactful yeah. now my last question for you theoretically mm -hmm. you get hired to teach a film class what mm -hmm. films would be in your curriculum <sighs> I thought about this one a lot too, because I the like first thing you have to decide is like what are you teaching? And I don't know that I'm qualified to really teach anything on film other than the way that films make people feel. Um or like the messages that films are trying to say, and those are kind of lumped together. It could be different. So like I took a theology and film class in college. I, uh, it was really, I think it should have been titled philosophy and film, um, because I went to a Christian university, but we we definitely talked about like the Hinduism values in certain films or, you know, Jew Judaism values or um, uh, Islamic values in films, like, like kind of those things. But it, it you know, is certainly more, I, I would say philosophy, you know, we even talked about even like non-religious, you know, hedonism and things like that. So um, I would love to teach a philosophy in film class, uh, a philosophy, yeah, philosophy in film class um, using um film as a way of like expressing um things but I, like because that's ultimately like my favorite thing about films is fig like figuring out what does it say and that's why like man there's been a lot of movies that i've just watched and me and my wife get to the end of it and i'm like what's the point why does this movie exist and like if i don't have an answer to that like i just don't enjoy the film um anymore like sure why does transformers to six boom boom pew pew right and no. i'm satisfied pew, pew, but pew, like pew. or but like i've just come across like a decent number of films recently that it's just like what was the point of that and she was like i don't really know and i'm like i think that's why i don't like it like or what's the or like what's the mess oh man like let me tell you i just watched silent night and i hate that movie like it's really cool but I can't stand everything that that movie stands for. And I really appreciated um, kind of the a completely opposite viewpoint that I had from the movie uh, that May wrote for the website. May's review for Silent Night was actually killer. Uh, made me think about things, things in a different perspective. It was awesome. But I was like, the movie says definitively he is right. Like, 
doesn't wrestle with it at all, doesn't want us to wrestle with it. It just wants to. And I just think that 2023 films should be more nuanced than that. Anyway, sorry, I'm going on a tangent. So I think like a philosophy of film or something like soul of film or something might be up my alley. And so I would show like I would try to demonstrate that like I, like I would show um, I think maybe Silent Night might actually be a really great example. And we can like discuss like what is the movie actually trying to say? Um you know, or, or but I, I would throw Cinema Paradiso in there as well. I would I would love to throw in Ikiru, and I just watched Tokyo Story. Mm-hmm. Tokyo Story would be a great one to kind of throw in there. But like now, now here's the problem with that. Like I'm a very surface level kind of guy. Like I'm not the kind of guy that watches a movie and is like, oh, like it'll t- I'll I'll have to listen to somebody and hear their take on a movie. Like my mind has been changed thinking about Jordan Peele's Nope. From the way that Dicer thinks about Jordan Peele's Nope, which is the way that Jordan Peele thinks about Nope, uh, based off of an interview that I confirmed. And it's just like, oh, shoot, now I love the movie. I thought it was fine. It's just an OK alien invasion movie. And then he's like, it's actually all about the camera and about how like people of color now have like a thing to capture it. Like, you mm-hmm. know, and what that means for the world. I'm like, shoot, now I love the movie. Right. So like, but I would never have pieced that together myself. So um so i'm not qualified to teach that class i i just think more people should see ikiru and tokyo story and, and talk, the talk about them. yeah it's you sit and you talk about it let, yeah, yeah. let the conversation flow afterwards yeah i'll let it, i'll have it just be a discussion base i actually used to teach uh i used to teach film um at this ministry that i worked at like we didn't i didn't teach film but i talked to, like we taught we talked about like I, sh- I showed students gone baby gone. And I was like, now let's talk about the ending of that movie. Um, and I showed students um, like other movies that were like deal, a- any sort of thing that was dealing with um, any sort of like moral quandary and like breaking down philosophies. I had a lot of fun teaching that class, but awesome. um, it was discussion based and I never had an end goal. It was just, we need to process that, you know, Absolutely. Um, I had a lot of fun with that. Well, and that brings us to the end of this Woo! particular episode. But how I always like to wrap things up, I let my guests ask me a question. Mm-hmm. So Aaron, what would you like to ask the Wasteland reviewer? This is, uh, I totally forgot. It just said wild card in the notes. And I was like, oh, that's a random question for me. Um... No, it's a random question for me. <laughs> <laughs> um... Hmm. I all right. I've got I've got a thread of a question. I just need to piece it together. Okay. Um. While I'm piecing it together, um, is Die Hard a Christmas movie? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that was easy. Like, <laughs> I my thing with that is, how's it not? It's at a Christmas party. It has Christmas music in it. The score mm-hmm. even has like the bells in it, right. and it's about family. Well, and this Come and together. even like the the like sets and whatnot like the paper is clearly meant to be snow um my my big thing is christmas involves the plot so it's a christmas movie you know that's why there's low security not Tony plaza anyway and yeah, and the villains knew it well yeah and the thing is a christmas movie isn't a genre it You're just right. happens to center around christmas action movies can be christmas movies too people so so let me let me all right so so i've got my real question now okay um, I feel like Elf is the most recent staple in everybody's yeah. yearly holiday watch. If you if, since Elf, if you could pick one movie for people to throw in their December watch, um, what's that one movie and why? So this is a really obscure one, but and I'm gonna say this because I want people to watch it. Anna and the Apocalypse. <laughs> I got 20 minutes into it and shut it off, man. I couldn't. <laughs> I'll have to give you one British. Time. Do you want zombies? Do you want Christmas? Do you want a musical? It's all of those things. I remember randomly seeing that in a theater. Like it was playing at an AMC in PA. And I went to go see it. I'm like, this was so unexpected. Because like I didn't know anything about it going in. And I loved Ella Hunt, uh-huh. who's, who plays Anna. She wound up playing the sister-in-law in Dickens. Uh with uh Haley Steinfeld on Apple sure. and oh it's I really enjoy the songs I think it's just a crazy fun movie and you know 
it's a teenage uh coming of age story set during a zombie apocalypse at Christmas in Britain and people sing. So it's the most random thing. Yeah. Um another serious one, this is very recent. I think the holdovers is gonna turn out to be one that I think a lot of people are gonna rewatch. It's kind of so, what inspired the question. Like it just well, feels like I, I watched it two weeks, two, three weeks ago. I already want to watch it again. Like yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, but yeah, like, yeah. Uh, so, like I, I was like, I feel movies. like, I feel like maybe Klaus like has become a staple in a lot of households. I still haven't I seen like it yet. Too. But like, I don't know that like since Elf, there's been such a definitive like. This movie has to go in your in in. I think the holdover is should be that. Yeah. Um, well, I know for me personally, for my life, it my Christmas movie has always been Muppets Christmas Carol. Yeah. Watched it with my mom literally every single year that I can remember in my life for Christmas, except for 2020. And that's because I wasn't really in enclosed spaces with my mom at that time. Yeah. And it just, you know, Marley and Marley. I have like almost all the uh, Fungo Pop now <laughs> because they all got released. And I got almost all of them for my birthday for people. I'm just there like, go. beautiful. That's awesome. I got Marley and Marley, Charles Dickens, and Rizzo the Rat. <laughs> and I love how Ebenezer Scrooge is dancing like this. In the oh, yeah? Scene. And then Fozzie Wig. <laughs> My rubber awesome. chicken factory. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. But Aaron, thank you so much. And I, I, I hadn't realized it'd been that long. And I know think about that. That's well, we've done Carpenter years. and uh, well, that's the thing. We've done some of my Scorsese. other shows, yeah. and you know, I show up on the podcast. Yeah. So, but thank you so much for coming on. For sure, anytime, dude. And thank all of you out there for always tuning in, supporting your Wasteland Reviewer.